something that can be quite a bit of work, I'm sure each one of us has done this at some point, is preparing and, and planning and coordinating for some kind of big event in our lives. Maybe it's like a, a party or a birthday or some kind of celebration, maybe like an anniversary or a wedding. You know, it could be it could be anything. But we have to we have to plan ahead of time. We have to prepare ahead of time, coordinate ahead of time, so that it can be a successful and a fun event. You know, there are things to think about, like food, right? Maybe entertainment. You know, maybe a DJ, or maybe uh, if it's a birthday party, you know, some kind of other uh, entertainment. For some reason, a clown is coming to my mind. Not everybody loves clowns, though. <laughs> But as, as we prepare and as we plan and as we start to coordinate, you know, oftentimes there's like a level of anticipation, right? That anticipation builds and we pray that this uh, planning will pay off and be a success. There's a level of excitement that starts to build up for that day of the events or the event itself. There's a building up of that emotion. Sometimes that can be a roller coaster. Of emotion and we hope and we pray that that this event whatever it may be a birthday party a, an anniversary a, a wedding you know anything that, that it'll be fun that it'll be a success that people will enjoy themselves one of the, the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about this idea was like a, a sports team right that prepares and that works hard throughout the season, like a, like a baseball team, like a football team, like the Bills do a lot of work in preparing for the season and hopeful success. You know, when we see that in like the playoffs and then the Super Bowl is this huge celebration for the whole community. After all that work and that anticipation pays off and we're, you know, obviously the Buffalo community is praying for that for the Bills next season. Even at the, the, the boxing gym that I'm a part of, at the end of May, there's going to be a, a big event in Lockport with a number of amateur boxing and, and kickboxing uh, fights there for a number of the people who are at the gym. But they're doing a lot of hard work and a lot of training in anticipation that that's going to pay off in this successful uh, event that they're going to participate in. Even the owner of the gym, who's a guy named uh, Joe Taylor, he's preparing for a professional World Kickboxing Association championship belt at the end of May. He's even fighting an opponent from Scotland in this. But they're putting in a lot of hard work. They're training. They want to make sure it's a success. It doesn't just happen. There's building up and preparing for it. And then once you reach that that event itself, that day itself, right after all the planning, maybe for the party or the or the uh, the event, after all that anticipation and that preparation and that emotion that goes into it, the coordination, that event itself, right, it has an incredibly significant meaning. As we've gone through the last several chapters in Isaiah, we've been looking at this idea and this continued theme of the restoration of Jerusalem, the restoration of Judah, and the restoration of Israel, and the restoration of the temple. And we see what that means for the people of Judah. That there's going to be healing in that relationship with God. That there's going to be restoration in that. And especially with the Restoring of the temple and restoring of Jerusalem, that's symbolic of the people's right relationship with God. As we read Isaiah chapter 61 last week, we looked at some of the themes like healing and deliverance and being set free and restoration and renewal that comes with that return to Jerusalem. Those words, as we talked about last week, they would have had a very real and powerful and deep and significant impact to the people who were subjected and forced to move into exile in Babylon 
for such a long period of time, for 70 years. And we kind of see that dual prophetic meaning that there's almost two layers of prophecy. And the immediate layer is that immediate return to Jerusalem and the restoration of the temple, the restoration of that right relationship with God. But in that deeper, kind of more long-term prophetic meaning, it's the coming Messiah who brings all of that. And it's not just for Jerusalem or the people of Judah, but for all the world in a very real and powerful way. The, the restoration of Jerusalem after exile points to the restoration that Jesus Christ brings to all of humanity. Isaiah chapter 62 speaks of that culmination. And what it will be like brings realization to that anticipation and that excitement and those kinds of emotions. And it not only points to the culmination of what Jerusalem's restoration means, but it also points to, again, in that second kind of deeper layer of, of uh, prophecy, the arrival of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ means. So let me read Isaiah chapter 62, starting at verse 1. It's just 12 verses, so I'm going to read the whole chapter. So here's Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be turned forsaken, and your land shall no more be turned desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land, Mary. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be Mary. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Upon your walls, O Jerusalem, I have posted sentinels. All day and all night, they shall never be silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest, and give him no rest, until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it renowned throughout the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies. And foreigners shall not drink the wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in my holy courts. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up an ensign over the peoples. The Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to daughter Zion, see your salvation comes, his reward is with him. And his recompense before him. They shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. As we read this scripture, and as we listen to this scripture, there are some key words here that point to that arrival, that event, that day of Jerusalem's restoration, and what that means. In verse 1, it's that idea of vindication. We see that in verse 2 as well. We see God calling them a new name. It means a new identity, a new status. It's that excitement. I really like verse 3. It really just gives such a great description of what that means. A crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. And as Isaiah continues to share these words on behalf of God to the people of Judah, 
We see another illustration here, and that's the illustration of marriage. We see what the significance of that marriage means, that, that God says, the young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And he calls his people, my delight is in her. He calls his land, Mary, that the land itself is going to be restored and engaged in, in this celebration. The significance of this marriage, and Isaiah 62 shows us, is this new and this deep moment in this relationship between God and his people. And it just shows the depth and the sincerity and the seriousness of God's love for his people. In verse 12, we see what that means as well. Your salvation comes. His reward is with him. His recompense before him. And he tells his people what they'll be called. Holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Called sought out and not forsaken. As we've been looking at this, this this theme and this idea of the people of God returning out of exile from Babylon, and, and they're slowly starting to come back to Jerusalem. We've been looking at the anticipation of returning to Jerusalem and what the restoration of God's kingdom for his people meant. Again, we see that immediate meaning there, that immediate return. But it also points to something or someone Greater. It points to a Messiah. It points to the coming kingdom of God and really what that means for not only just Jerusalem and Judah, but for all of God's people. Israel and Judah may not have realized that God would be opening this opportunity and this invitation of restoration to everyone. But he did for all creation, for all people, through Jesus Christ. This marriage that God is speaking of in Isaiah 62, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that marriage. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that wedding. And even, even these verses, as they share the culmination of God's people returning to Jerusalem and what that means, it's also verses that anticipate the arrival of Jesus Christ. Everything in the story of Israel and Judah and Jerusalem and God's people from the very beginning pointed to and prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Everything prepares and points to the coming of God with his people. From Even from Adam and Eve, and even through the patriarchs of Israel to everything in their history that we see in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets and the writing, it was all that kind of planning and that preparation and that coordination for God to be present among his people and to bring this hope and this culmination of restoration to all of creation. Points to Jesus Christ. When Jesus is giving his sermon on the mount, and I know I've shared this verse many times, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus Christ fulfills Everything that we know as the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that. And as we read last week and looked at Isaiah 61 and also looked at Luke chapter 4 when Jesus read the scroll of Isaiah 61, these words had very significant and powerful meaning. I'm just going to read what Jesus read once again. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 18. And this is from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant who sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. These are powerful words. These are incredible words. These are significant words. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We look at the themes of Isaiah 62. Jesus Christ fulfills those words. Jesus Christ enables all people to have the opportunity to be that crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and to be that royal diadem in the hand of God, to be part of the holy and redeemed people, to be part of the sought out and not forsaken people. Can you imagine being there in the synagogue and realizing the significance of what Jesus is proclaiming? It's one of the reasons they got so angry at him. That Jesus is proclaiming that he is the one. He is the one who fulfills scripture. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And they may have been so angry because Jesus, they thought that Jesus may have just been saying this flippantly or taking it for granted, not realizing the significance of what he said. But as I said last week, Jesus fully realizes exactly what he is saying. He knows who he is. He knows the incredible and the deep and the powerful significance of what he's saying. Isaiah 62 talks about that culmination and in Jesus Christ. We find that culmination for everyone. As we approach Easter, as next week we approach Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter and everything about Holy Week. There's significance that the events of Holy Week are part of the fulfillment of what this scripture is saying in Isaiah 62. Even the journey to the cross itself, the pain and the suffering that Jesus went through, That perhaps being a crown of beauty in the hand of God and a royal diadem in the hand of God. And when we hold that in one hand and the journey to the cross in the other hand, when we balance those things out, try to understand what they mean, perhaps part of it means that life is not about comfort. The life is not about 100% safety every second of our lives. That's something that our world seems to be missing. But perhaps there's something deeper and more to life. And then we have the resurrection a few days after that. That as we sung this morning, that very broad body that was breathing Life that out of that silence and out of that darkness, a lion came roaring. As we think about the journey to the cross and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we understand all of this together. That all of this is the pivotal, the crux, the turning point in all of history for all of humanity for each one of our hearts, for each one of our lives, for our eternal life, for the lives that we live here on earth and, and what we do and, and how we act and what we say. That the significance of being this royal diadem in the hand of God, this crown of beauty, I mean, knowing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, knowing Jesus Christ as the atonement of our sin, knowing that Jesus Christ 
gives true opportunity for all people to have right relationship with God. That Jesus Christ brings renewal and healing and restoration for our hearts. That Jesus Christ heals just all the, the garbage that we go through in life. Whether that may be something of our own fault, whether it may be something at the hands of someone else's sin that we're the victim of, or maybe it's just the general brokenness of the world and all the broken situations that we see as a result of the compounding effects of sin. That Jesus Christ takes that and turns that brokenness into that crown of beauty and that royal diadem. It gives us hope and the opportunity to live in a different way, to show and to share something different than what we're used to, to experience and be renewed by the true and the holy love of God and know what salvation and sanctification means. To have that continued renewal and empowerment in each one of our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in the way that Jesus Christ has shown us of what it actually means to truly be human. Jesus Christ is the definition for human. Our brokenness, our fallenness, our sinfulness, that is not the definition of human. That is a fallen definition of human. Jesus Christ shows us what it means to be truly human. And only in Jesus Christ can we be truly human. Only in relationship with God can we be truly human. Isaiah 62 points to more than just the restoration of Jerusalem. That is very important. But just how important that is then shows just how much more powerful and important the work that Jesus Christ did. I don't think that it's any kind of accident at all that this theme of a wedding is constantly used when referred when referring to God with his people, when referring to Jesus Christ. We think about the very first miracle that John recorded in his gospel. He recorded that as a wedding on purpose. We have the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they share the story of Jesus Christ in an almost linear way. And a lot of times people will say, John doesn't do that, so I don't know if we can rely on John as much, but John just has a different way of telling that story. He's telling the story of Jesus Christ in a different way to emphasize a different point. And it's not an accident that the first miracle that John records is at a wedding. In John chapter 2, that at this wedding, Jesus turns this water into the very best wine that these people have ever experienced. Jesus is that culmination of, of everything that the Old Testament anticipates. And here, in this miracle, Jesus shows that in a powerful and a real way. And they experience this personally. His life, his death, his resurrection, that is the fulfillment of God's plan. That is the, the, the wedding event between God and his people that the prophet Isaiah is referring to here in Isaiah 62. When Matthew, in Matthew, uses the same illustration when he talks about what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus is the bridegroom. 
may experience that life in him. His life, his death, his resurrection, even that points to his return. When the groom spends eternity with God's renewed creation, a creation that is free from sin, he spends eternity with his bride, the church. Today, we are people who know that wedding, that excitement, that marriage. We know the excitement in the life of Jesus Christ. Israel and Judah and Jerusalem, they experienced the preparation for Jesus Christ. They experienced the planning and the anticipation, the coordination for that. Isaiah 62 points to that event, that wedding itself, the groom's arrival and what that means. For us today, we are living in the time of Jesus Christ. He has come. He has lived among us. He has died as the atonement for the world's sins. And Jesus Christ has conquered death, which we will celebrate in a few weeks. And Jesus Christ is the king over all creation. There's a reason that we say we're living in the year 2022 AD, because AD means Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. We are living in the year of our Lord. We are living in the time of Jesus Christ. We know this joyful event that Isaiah speaks about in a very real way. We're living in it in a way that the people of the Old Testament could not even have imagined, but they were only hoping for and praying for and anticipating. As people who know Jesus Christ, as people who know the one that Isaiah 62 was pointing to in such a prophetic way, this also points to how we live. Are we people who live in that excitement, in that joy, in that hope? Are we people who live in confidence that Jesus Christ is the King, that Jesus Christ will return? Are we living in the peace of a Messiah? Are we living in the humility of knowing that we serve the eternal King of all creation, the entire universe? Are we people who are living in the love that Jesus Christ has shown in the Gospels? A powerful, life-changing love. Jesus Christ has given us an example of what it means to actually be human. Are we living in that example? We live in this way, and we also share this way of life with others. That we can be people who are hopeful. These aren't things that we just do by ourselves. These are things that we that are done in relationship. Being hopeful is something that makes an impact on other people's lives. Being joyful is something that makes an impact on other people's lives and changes other people's lives. Being someone who is forgiving makes an impact on someone else's life in a powerful way. Being someone who is loving in the same way that Jesus Christ was is something that makes a difference in someone else's life. These are things that that can change the world around us. It's not something that we do on our own, but it's something that we do in partnership with the Holy Spirit. It's something that we do as people who are part of God's kingdom. The forgiveness that we show others, it gives others the hope of renewal and restoration and gives them the opportunity to forgive, and it spreads all over creation. In Isaiah 62, God shows his forgiveness to Israel and to Judah and Jerusalem. We know as we've studied the previous 61 chapters, the sins of this nation. We know that, that God could have very well just said, we're done. But he didn't. Because he loves them. And he showed his forgiveness to them. That if God will forgive Israel and Judah and Jerusalem, 
And if Jesus Christ will forgive each one of us, it means we have this new life. That we become part of the crown of beauty and part of the royal diadem. That we become called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought out and not forsaken. Are we going to be people who extend that same love, who extend that same restoration, who extend that same invitation to the party that, that we're already a part of, to the wedding that we're already a part of? Are we going to extend that invitation, that opportunity for renewal to others, even those who may have wronged us? And we know that the world is filled with people who have wronged one another ourselves included. Are we going to be people who share that life-changing love in the same way that God does to Judah and his people to give them the opportunity to be this royal diadem? Jesus forgives us and gives each one of us new life. We have to be willing to do the same we're people who live in a different way. We're people who personally know the group. And we are living in the life of Jesus Christ and the life of his Holy Spirit. We are people who are living in the fulfillment of the wedding that Isaiah 62 describes. Let's pray.